The Taking Tree by Randall Anthony Jones. The captain sat on a bench in a grassy clearing looking at a huge tree, roughly a kilometer tall. He and the grass and the ridiculously large plant were inside an even more ridiculously huge geodesic dome, a bit over nine kilometers across, and perhaps half that tall at its apex. There were smaller trees, plants, and flying animals, and bugs, and rodents, and bushes, and walkways in there, as well as several of what appeared to be snack bars, though it was hard to be sure, as they were buried under centuries of accumulated bird crap. This is damn peculiar, this solar system, he said. His assistant agreed. They had discovered it by chance on a long-range probe after their ship went slightly off course. There was nothing remarkable about the star itself. A standard yellow one of a type that made up perhaps a tithe of all the stars in existence, but it had planets. That was a bit more noteworthy, but still not really remarkable. When the science officer informed him that the solar system consisted of only two small rocky planets, a rudimentary asteroid field, and nothing else, that was when the captain had to sit up and take notice. We'll check it out. Send the probe data to HQ along with a mention that we're diverting from our planned patrol route to investigate. The communications officer had agreed. Science, send the probe data to astrogation so that we can plot a course through that system's peripheral icy particle cloud. There isn't one, sir, the science officer responded. What? Probe data indicates no icy planetesimals whatsoever. Also, as you can see, here he touched a display screen, the asteroid belt is oddly dense and close to the star, well inside the orbit of both planets. Huh. Well, the positioning is odd. I'll grant you that. Any idea as to the density? I'd have to make some estimations about the composition based on spectrographic and data and an electromagnetic carrier wave reflection, and the captain rolled his eyes. Like all science officers, he tended to blather on. The captain poked him with a finger, and the scientist quickly snapped to the point. 4.8 times 10 to the 24th power kilograms. Holy hells! That is dense! You could almost build a planet the size of our own out of that. Yes, sir. Asteroid belts tend to be made of detritus too small to be and dispersed to coalesce into larger bodies, so this level... You know, I did take some science classes in the academy, the captain said, irritated. Of course. My apologies. In any event, this is the densest asteroid belt ever encountered. There is no scientific precedent for it, and, in fact, its mere existence violates several laws of physics. Damn peculiar, the captain said. It took them eight days to actually enter the solar system. They launched several probes on the way to get more data, only to find it, confoundingly, that it was really every bit as empty as the first probe had suggested. As they crossed the heliopause, the science officer said, We have life signs. Well, that was news. Life was very rare, very rare indeed. Theirs was the twelfth starship ever built, and their people had been flying interstellar space for a century. And yet this was only the second time life had been discovered. The universe was basically an unforgivingly hostile place. They'd all get promotions and hefty bonuses for sure. Spectrograph is showing absorption lines indicative of massive plant cover on the inner planet, photosynthetic, probably based on chlorophyll or something like it. Massive oceans, a disproportionately large moon. Wow, just like home. The astrogation officer said, what are the odds? The captain shot him a look that made him blush, and he said nothing more. All right, let's designate that one X1, and its moon we'll call X1A. What about the other planet? Call it X2, the science officer suggested. Why not? The captain agreed. Unremarkable, about half the size of X1, perhaps a third the mass, tenuous CO2 atmosphere, unusually large quantities of water, ice at the poles, no magnetic field, no moons, or at least none that I can see from here. It's, if it's got any, they're insignificantly small. No life signs. Wait, no life signs, but... But what? We've encountered hundreds of planets like X2. There shouldn't be any life there. It, its mass makes it incapable of holding any kind of survivable, substantial atmosphere. But I'm getting very faint life signs. Double discovery bonus for the crew, the captain exclaimed. Several of the bridge officers hooted at this. The captain allowed it for a short time, then ordered them back to work. Starship life was hard. They deserved this moment. Could it be aquatic life, like under the ice, like on um, Bebop or Zarela Laba? That was the only other place life had ever been discovered. The oversized moon of a super Jovian world 25 light years from home and 40 light years from their present location. Beneath kilometers of ice, there was an ocean of liquid water, enough uh, through which swam millions of species of xenoforms. Alas, none of them were sapient. No, sir, I wouldn't be able to detect that with this equipment anyway. But there, there's not that much ice, and the life signs aren't reading around the poles, they're reading equatorial. Damn peculiar, the captain said. I agree, sir. A day later, they pulled into orbit around X-1. The chief planetologist asked the captain to meet him in her lab, so he went down. There's a problem, she sounded gleeful. There always is, 
Well, we've dropped a dozen geomapping satellites, and we've got a pretty good mosaic of the entire planet now. We've kept finding oddities like this. She displayed a picture of complex, interesting striations. And this, she showed another. And this, she showed a third. At first, we thought they were some kind of tectonic feature. They're roads, the captain said. His eyes were faintly aglow with the thought of how huge the bounty was for discovering sapient life. He didn't get into the interstellar navy in hopes of making money, but he certainly wasn't adverse to the possibility. At the same time, this complicated matters considerably. I presume you followed them and they led to cities? It's hard to tell. I'm not a biologist or a geologist. But assuming these are roads, and I agree that's most likely, then they're pretty old. We're only finding them in desert areas. In the more verdant ones, they disappear, presumably overgrown by vegetation. I've found places that appear to be cities, but if so, they're in ruins and overgrown. And you know, from home, glass and metal structures tend to deteriorate much faster than masonry ones, particularly in active climates. In a couple of centuries... Wait, 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 wait. You're telling me that these people have been extinct for centuries? Oh, no, sir. They're not extinct. We've found, well, we're not sure, but we think we've found indications of inhabited villages and possibly some herding or tilled fields. There's definitely people down there, but they're Stone Age. The captain nodded knowingly and floated up the hall to his cabin. There were protocols in place for first contact situations. Thus far, they never needed to be used. He knew full well what they said. They forbade any landings or attempts to contact um, the locals by the discoverers themselves. A xenocultural observation post would have to be set up. They'd watch these new sapiens for at least a decade or so before deciding what to do next. Just the same, he was in an uncharted spot in history, and his mood was all over the place as a result. He felt the need for guidance and pulled the old hardbound rule book out of the shelf. He didn't even bother to open it, just clenched it to his chest, almost like a talisman. After a few minutes, it worked. He activated the intercom. Bridge, this is the captain. Break orbit and lay in a course for planet X2. Also prep the extended recon shuttle for launch to that asteroid belt. They found the dome from orbit. Ordinarily, they would have taken shuttles down to the surface, but as X2's gravity was low and its atmospheric pressure was only around half a millibar, they decided to simply land the whole ship instead. The life signs consisted of a thin and tenuous equatorial belt of lichens, but they were ruins everywhere, as far as the eye could see in every direction. As dead as it was now, this planet had been densely populated at one time. Two days later, the captain sat on the bench, gazing at the freakish tree. "'How's it going?' a voice asked behind him. He turned from the waist to look, but he already knew who it was from the eastern accent. "'Hiya, Doc,' the captain said. The doctor plopped down on the bench next to him and handed him two pills. "'Take them. What are they? Mood stabilizer. You've been up and down and up and down and up and down for the last week. Figured we could, you, we could head off a manic episode. And also some anti-nausea stuff to help you cope with the low gravity. Hmm, good thinking. He swallowed both of them dry. "'You know, I like it here. It reminds me of home,' the captain said. "'The trees aren't so huge at home.' True, said the captain, but we've been cooped up on that damn tub for three years. It's nice to feel a little grass beneath my feet. Whereas our science officer and Wilker and Salig are poking around through the ruins attached to this complex to find out what, what they can. I have got shuttle crews flying all around looking for points of interest. Did you get those corp, uh, corpses I sent over? Yeah, unpleasant looking critters. Yeah, wrong number of arms. What can you tell me about them? Captain, I'm just a doctor. The biology team could do a better explanation. Just the gist it for me, doctor. Just, please. Okay, the medical officer sighed heavily and focused his thoughts. Well, the biggest news is that their DNA has two less nucleotides than ours. Really? That few? Is life even impossible with such a small number of base pairs? At uh, just that moment, a cute rodent with a fancy tail leapt lazily from a branch on the tree and sailed two meters to the next branch, then scurried away. Evidently so, said the doctor. B. Baba's Relalaban life has two more nucleotides than we do. Focus, Doc. Sorry, they're carbon-based. They live in a range of temperatures and pressures almost exactly like ours. We breathe the same kind of air, obviously. Brain capacity is slightly larger than ours. I talked to Saleg, and she's oh, guesstimating that they were perhaps about 10% smarter than we are, on average. Well, that's disquieting, but not entirely unexpected. From what the science boys are telling me, their technology was way more advanced than ours. What else have you got? Um, I surmise that they came from X1. They definitely did not evolve here. The strata out there that contains biological remains is perhaps a thousand years thick, give or take a century, and it's under a thousand years of dust, again, give or take a century. So the planet's been abandoned for at least that long. My thinking, the captain said, is that they tried to make this planet more like their own. They tried to make it capable of sustaining life. 
Why would they do that? The gravity well is so shallow that there's no way it could sustain an atmosphere for very long. I don't know. This is an unusually empty solar system. Maybe they felt like they had to get all their eggs out of one basket. Still, the doctor said, it seems like a conspicuous waste of resources. I agree. They could... Just at that moment, the captain's earpiece bleeped. It was the communications officer explaining that they'd just gotten a message from the astrogator and his team, who had just arrived at the mysterious asteroid belt. After a brief and flustered conversation that the doctor could only hear half of, the captain terminated the call and looked ashen. The asteroids? All 860 trillion tons of them? They're artificial. They're all artificial. A massive array of solar power satellites. They convened the staff meeting in a temporary room in a large wood-paneled area inside the sprawling dome complex. It had been hastily and somewhat destructively converted into a lab. They sat around an awkwardly high table built for, by the vanished aliens, but it was more annoying than simply standing in the low gravity, so they abandoned that almost immediately. First, the astrogator, having returned with his team from the belt, gave a report in which he indicated that the entire solar panel array was several thousand years old and badly deteriorated. Few, if any, of the satellites were still functioning. The chief engineer had calculated that at their peak, the array had probably captured 5% of the star's energy, more than enough to power both planets in the solar system, regardless of how large their populations had been. So, is it reasonable to surmise that's what happened here? Their power network broke down and the civilization collapsed? The captain asked. Perhaps on X1, but indications are that the belt array ceased to function long after X2 was abandoned. Damn peculiar. Where'd they get all that material from to build it anyway? No one had any idea. The science officer explained that the room they were meeting in had originally been an alien library. They had evidently recorded thoughts or memories on some other form of psychic impressions on little semi-solid blobs that looked like chrome. He held out one in his hand. We have reason to believe that they wanted us, well, someone sentient anyway, to find this particular recording. Why do you think that? Because of its placement. All the others have been found in small bottles on the shelves, but this one was placed on that. He pointed to a small, ornate pedestal that had several flashing light arrows pointing at it. Dr. Wilker hasn't fully cracked their language yet, but his tentative translation of the writing on the arrows is, look here, or something similar. So can we play this stuff, the recordings? Not yet, but there are detailed electrical schematics we've found, and the doctor and the engineer and I feel that we can eventually interface their playback mechanism with one of our own brain scanners. With your permission, of course. You even have to ask? Of course! It was three weeks later when they finally got the thing to work. The captain had grown to love the dome and spent all of his free time there, as did much of the rest of the crew. They tried not to think of the endless ruins and icy deserts outside. Finally, the day came when they needed a volunteer. I'll do it, the captain said. Sir, it's dangerous, and it could conceivably kill you. And he ignored the doc's protestations and laid down on the bed of the brain scanner. After several minutes of jiggery-pokery, the science officer pressed start. Suddenly he was in the dome, but there was nothing in it but grass. The huge tree was just a sapling. The world outside the dome was dark and cold, but not dead yet. He took a step. This was remarkable. It was just like he was actually here. The, he heard a voice behind him and turned to look. Gah! He exclaimed, startled. Sir, what's wrong? What happened? Should we break the connection? Ah, just, 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 just give me a moment, he said. Wow, that was weird. I'm experiencing a, a kind of subjective simulation. As though I'm in one of their bodies. They're not hinged the way we are. The head moved when I turned to look. Do you want us to... No, 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 no. I'm fine. There's a guide here. I'm going to go talk to him. He did. Welcome, the guide said. What would you like to know? What happened here? The captain asked. His brain was assaulted by static. No, no, not static. There was a pattern to it. But there was so much contained in each dot of the snow assaulting him. This is damn difficult, he said. They don't think the way we do. They don't process information in an intuitive... If I can focus... He saw a large gas giant planet with beautiful rings and numerous moons while he watched the planet gradually fade into dust and the dust itself was further uh, dissembled, assembled by impossibly tiny machines. Some of this stuff moved one direction, but the rest of it, the dusty dross and the moons, were simply left behind. Eventually, the dust was carried away by the solar wind... Later, the moons were similarly disassembled. He sneezed and lost his focus, and saw an earlier phase, another planet, with a large icy moons. Fleets of ships were mining the ice and taking it to a planet, X2 presumably, and dropping it into the atmosphere. He saw X2 in its glory days, with beautiful 
pink sand beaches and deep blue oceans that rolled like a dream in the low gravity while billions of gawky aliens lumbered about their lives. He heard strange music. He turned to see where it was coming from and saw the destruction of the natural asteroid belt beyond the orbit of X2 and the construction of the vast artificial asteroid belt inside the orbit of planet X1. For some reason, probably sleep deprivation, he absently wondered about his childhood pet, and somehow the machine interpreted this to mean he wanted to see the history of the solar array. So he watched time roll backwards, the satellite asteroids gradually coalescing themselves into a cloudy but very solid planet. This kind of phantasmagoria went on for the better part of a day before he couldn't stand it anymore, and he called for them to pull him out of the machine. The captain sat on the bed of the brain scanner with his legs dangling over the side. He looked ashen and shaken and hadn't spoken yet. He was compulsively drumming on the bed, with one hand, and running the fingers of his other hand through his hair. Someone brought him a drink, and presently he took that with his third hand. The name of this planet is Mars, he said. This used to be a much larger, more conventional solar system. The inhabitants of Earth, that's the third planet, um, the one that we're calling X1. They had somehow gotten it into their heads that Mars was the future home of their species. Once they got reasonably good at space flight, they set all of their resources into making this planet more like their homeworld. This was a process called terraforming, terra being an obsolete name for Earth. Why did they do that? This planet can't hold an atmosphere. They believed. They looked at him for more. That's all there is to it, the captain said. They believed. This planet was their only option, so they shipped the resources here from other planets to replace the air and water that escaped into space every year. Presently, their technology advanced to the point where they could simply take whole planets apart and move the resources they needed here. Wait, said the doctor, you're telling me that these people, humans, they're called, these humans disassembled an entire solar system just to keep refilling a leaky bucket? That's the stupidest thing imaginable, the science officer concurred. They could have built really large space habitats like we've done, or, with the technology you're describing, they probably could have simply built suitable planets from scratch. Probably, the captain said absently. Why? They believed. What else can I tell you? Somehow they got it into their heads that space wasn't worth anything unless it was just like Earth, and that people can only live on planets, and that Mars could be made like Earth. They became fanatics by the time they realized. No, admitted. They'd realized it a long time before that. Um, by the time they admitted to their mistake, they'd used up all of their resources, and they had no other options. Mars died. Presumably their civilization fell apart after that. The recording doesn't say. It was obviously made before that point. He turned at the waist, for his kind had no neck, and looked through the window across the open Martian surface and into the dome. He stared at the tree. It seemed malevolent to him. Now, evil, a vampiric thing, its tendrils sucking the lifeblood out of six planets and a hundred moons and millions of asteroids and billions of comets, all just to keep itself alive. Such madness. Do you think Fleet Command would mind if I killed that thing? He asked of no one in particular. No one said anything for a long time, and then the science officer mumbled something about not understanding such fanaticism. They were convinced they were building paradise, convinced that they had built paradise, but then they woke up and they found that it had only been a dream. The end. Thank you very much for your attention uh, and time uh, listening to my story. I apologize for my poor delivery skills. Um... This story was called The Taking Tree, which is an exploration of some of the potential downsides of terraforming, specifically terraforming Mars, uh, which nobody ever seems to really consider. I thought it was an interesting hook. If you guys liked it, please say so in comments. If not, well, please say so in comments. Um, this particular story was in one of my previous books, which was written under the pseudonym Kevin Long. Uh, it's called The Bones of an Angel, and I'll have a, a link below to take you there. If you enjoyed this story, please consider uh, buying my uh, current book, The Best of Randall Shans, which is my real name, not my, not my pen name. Uh, and, of course, there'll be information in the link and stuff to do that below. You can follow me on Facebook. Um, I have no idea what Twitter is, so you can't do that. Um, you can visit my website at uh, mahatmarandi.net, and I'm sorry about the compulsive swallowing. I think I ate something funny for breakfast this morning. Anyway, uh, and I apologize for my sort of halting, awful delivery. I'm not an actor or uh, an orator or really much of anything talented in that regard. Um, 
If you enjoyed the story, please tell your friends. Please subscribe. Please follow. Uh, and please buy my book. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. I should have a new song or a new story up next week. Again, thank you very much for your time and effort and listening. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.